it's one endless stream as the horizon into which each lived experience fits and has room to run its course. Time is the embrace of each lived experience, its support, by the field of temporality as a whole, a field that is lived insofar as we grasp the experience within the whole stream, which is also what we are. But the experience of time as both the duration of this lived experience and its fitting into or showing up upon the horizon of time as a whole, this indicates to us the whole of temporality as our stream of lived experiences as endless. If you look at page 194, the first full paragraph, the stream of lived experiences cannot begin and end. For the duration of my experience of typing this webinar presentation to get its bearings, to begin at all, it must appear against the backdrop of a stream of lived experience that cannot be grasped as having to begin or end. Beginning and ending, duration as such, these appear in a way similar to the unreflected within the reflected. Duration appears only against that which I am as a whole, a stream of all lived experiences in their interrelationships, as being prior to the discriminations of ending and beginning as things we notice. Something within the experience of temporality, of finitude as the ending and beginning of particular lived experiences, is the experience of unlimited flow. It does not mark itself out, the stream, as finite. It gives itself as that which allows finitude to mark out its own path. Time, like reflection then, in previous sections, is both an act and a method. It is that which sustains the relation of the experience to the ego, to other experiences, and to objects. Like reflection, our experience of lived time allows us to see at the edges on the periphery that it is our engagement with transcendence within imminence that gives us hope that our dying itself will not necessarily mean the end of consciousness since consciousness deals most essentially in an a priori, always already fashion with the world, with the object, with the unlimited, and with the priority of the indistinguished. Live time then, and this is on page 195, in the first full paragraph, I think, live time is a consciousness continuum of constant form. It is the flowing away that enables continuity, it is the passage that allows for the maintenance and seizing upon of meaning that transcends the passing away by working with the passing away and not against it. To hear this whole sentence, the whole verse of a song, is to let pass what has just come in favor of what is not here yet. To hear the last part of the sentence, the last part of the verse, is to recognize that working with the passing away is essential. It was not simply lost but remained embedded in its passing, in the to come and in the present as the constant form. To listen, to hear is not a mystery. It is the ecstatic character, which may explain Husserl's almost constant references to joy, it's the ecstatic character of experience with itself as it is broken open to the transcendent and the alien. The joy in reading and understanding and listening and participating this is the transcending of oneself and the content and returning to both of them in the openness to the to come. Joy is the mechanism by which temporality can claim mourning and surprise as its two-sided unity. Now I'm going to move on to section 82. But what is this stream of lived experiences? How are we to see it as the whole that I am? On page 196 at the top, Husserl says that the stream is, quote, an infinite unity. As this unity, even if without end, the stream is, however, quote, a self-enclosed concatenation of lived experiences. Geschlossenen Erlebnis zu self-enclosed concatenation, literally hanging together of experience. The boundless, the bounded it's bounded. Bounded endless stream is thus, quote, the whole essentially unified and strictly self-contained stream. That's page 196 at the bottom, as a correlate of the pure ego. Kirsten's translation at the end of section 82 even goes so far as to say the stream can be said to be, quote, summoning itself in its continuity of content. By summoning itself, he translates for Dan, 
Perhaps that translation is questionable, but the point is nevertheless this. The stream calls itself into being, demands itself to be continuous as the correlate of the pure ego. The ego thus must be temporal. The experience of the I is of necessity to be that which immediately and always is an experience of time. This is section 83. The correlation of ego and stream, however, is such that reflection on the stream can never grasp the stream in its wholeness all at once, or even in the interrelation between this lived experience and all other lived experiences that are implicated within it. Quote, this is 197 at the top, this whole concatenation is never given or to be given by a single pure regard, Reinen Blick. Somewhat like we cannot get a direct, adequate, lived sense of a city all at once, or from one vantage point, even from a plane, we cannot see the concatenations of lived experiences from within this one or that one. We cannot get to the entire stream of consciousness all at once from within the lived experience we are having, even though we are it. And yet, Husserl says about the stream, we can see it, this is still 197, quote, in the fashion of limitlessness in the progression. The experience of the stream of lived temporality as such is thus not another lived experience, but rather of an idea, the bottom of 197. Quote, in a certain way, we now seize upon the stream of lived experiences as a unity. We do not seize upon it as we do a single lived experience, but rather in the manner of an idea in the Kantian sense. Just as the city unfolds as one walks along the roads of one of its burrows, and just as the experience of the city is absolutely indubitable as a whole from within this part of it, and even though this experience of the city is, quote, grounded in intuition, yet the difference between the givenness of the whole and the givenness of this part is quite different. The progression and the style of the part gives the whole. The concatenations of Broadway with Brooklyn, if you've ever been in Broadway, you know how to go to Brooklyn, right? More than suggest, they give the whole. Each lived experience then is not self-sufficient. And he says this on page 198, first full paragraph. They rather flow into one another and are, quote, in need of supplementation. Erganzungsbedürftig. The whole thus appears within the belonging together. And the need and its complement, the supplementation that each further street or neighborhood offers, is the unfolding of the city in its givenness as a whole. Moving to 84. As we now move on from considering reflection as act, method, and object, and from reflection's description of consciousness as a whole stream and ego, we can finally see the overarching structure of lived experience as such, namely intentionality. Intentionality, the having of the object, the being toward the object, the fact that the object is the index of past, present, and future acts of the subject, furthers the claim that all consciousness is consciousness of. More than that, and this is page 199 in the first paragraph at the end, intentionality, quote, justifies the unity of the stream of lived experiences as consciousness as such. It is the being broken open toward alienness, the uneasy intimacy of the object with the subject that coalesces the stream of lived experiences towards the singular unity that it is. The all-embracing way in which my lived experiences situate me comes from the fact that they are always called forth by the object. The oneness of consciousness is sustained by its internal differentiation. Intentionality always has a horizon, a background of objects that are on the way to appearing directly. They are co-intended and as such form the interrelated correlate to the flowing together of the lived experiences themselves. Or to put it another way, the lived experiences interrelate because both the acts of consciousness and the objects of consciousness do. Acts relate to further acts, objects relate to further objects. And this means that the irritating sound of my neighbor's chainsaw can be bothering me for some time before I notice it within the attitude of irritation. 
I awaken, as it were, to the sound, becoming aware that I was already hearing it. This is page 201 at the top. Quote, such modes of consciousness can already be stirring, be arising in the background without having to be affected. Section 85. To preserve the unity by means of two-sidedness, Husserl maintains in section 85 that there are two kinds or strands of being that form the unity of consciousness as the stream of my experience. The two strands are form and matter, or hele and morphe. This is page 204, second full paragraph. This, quote, remarkable duality and unity is how Husserl describes the animating or, quote, sense bestowing, Zingebung, giving of sense, that consciousness as act performs upon, quote, formless stuffs, which is in the middle. The act of bestowing or giving sense, however, is a response to the already given, to the transcendence in imminence that is the very idea of stuff. Thus, I believe Husserl's discussion of sense bestowing, and Bill, this responds to your point about accomplishment, is more aligned with the notion of recognition. It is not out of nothing that the object receives sense any more than it is out of nothing that our language or expression can be said to fit phenomenological insights. There is an interplay down to the atomic level between act and object. They are, as Husserl says at the end of the section, strata, schichten, or layers. They are only pulled apart in order to reflect on the marvelous unity in duality. This is 86 now. Here in this final section of the chapter, Husserl moves from the separation of the noetic rays and the hyletic data toward their unity in the experience of an object as this or that. So I'm going to speak from page 207 in the first full paragraph. For Husserl, the noetic ray does its work by, quote, animating, beseland, stuff, animating stuff and combining it, reflectant, in order to bring about consciousness of something such that the objective unity of the objectivity allows of being harmoniously determined. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit. The active role of the noetic then combines a manifold by, I think the better translation is like ensouling, besailand, right? Such that the object that is to be taken up as what it is can allow its own determinacy. It is not that the object is simply suffering the creation of itself by the noetic. It is rather that the noetic takes a position, a direction within the data that is beneath and behind the object's appearance, and that the object responds as if in conversation with this hyletic slash noetic act. The noetic act, I believe, which is not a choice and not a reflective operation, but an always already kind of interaction and interplay. The object's allowance or affordance is the ensoulment of the animating ray. They are always already working together in play by the time we come to recognize their mutual belonging. The object takes up the ensouling act that is always already on the way, as it were, and allows itself to be, still on page 207, quote, made known or legitimated. That's Bekunden and Aufweisen. I might have translated those two words as manifested and exhibited, because it is the object's responsiveness to the act that is the agency of the appearing, the showing forth. Consciousness, as Husserl goes on to say in the next paragraph, is that which can, quote, bear in itself, it's like three lines from the bottom, in sich zu bergen, all meaning and sense. As bearing the object within itself, there is a kind of functional affirmation of the implicit process of indistinction, noetic and stuff layers, and of the passive synthesis of these layers into the explicit seizing upon of the object as such. We are pregnant with meaning by virtue of our being broken open toward the alien. Consciousness is from the beginning animated by, quote, teleology, as Husserl says on page 208. There is a kind of drawing together of noetic and hyletic, a drawing together toward an intimate and yet distinct relationship 
between subject and object that allows consciousness to see itself more precisely. The telos of phenomenology is the opening outward of the sense of transcendence as the opening inward of the event of consciousness. It is the process of coming to see oneself as the index of the objects yet to be taken up sides, implicit references, etc., in a call and response, a play of layers. As Hushul says on page 209 at the end of the first full paragraph, the zigzag or back and forth of the noetic and hyletic, the subject and the object, becomes the determination on the part of the phenomenologist to see, hopefully simultaneously, how, quote, an existing object is the correlate for concatenations of consciousness, just as conversely, the being of such concatenations is equivalent to an existing object. To see the correlate as the binding together of the acts of consciousness, while seeing the binding of the acts as the equivalence of the object, this does not reduce one to the other, but it does show just how intimately mapped onto one another the object and the acts are. Consciousness then is the name for the whole situation or event of meaning in its intimate indistinction and in its explicit marking out of the distinction. Consciousness is also perhaps unfortunately identified with acts. So I think we need to keep these different uses of the term consciousness separate. There is a democracy within experience, an agency of the object and an agency of the subject. But there is also a fundamental community that draws prior indistinction toward greater and more sophisticated distinction and insight. In phenomenology, we work toward the whole field of consciousness, toward the whole series of concatenations of consciousness as acts and toward the whole series of possible objects. But we do this knowing that the index of acts of consciousness that the objects are, these demand that I become more sophisticated in order to draw out how they are my index. The object finally is the appearance of my ecstatic being as involved with the object from before I recognized it as what it appears. The object is the implicit interreferential appearing of the system of the object the horizon, the world, the others, and myself. Husserl closes this chapter by saying that the, quote, this is page 210, quote, the pure hyletic is subordinated to the phenomenology of transcendental consciousness. By this, he means, I think, not to undo the democratic character of consciousness or the agency of the object. As he says at the end of the last paragraph, that neither hyle nor noesis is to be separated. What I think he means is that the notion of Hile, which is itself not experienced directly, is intended to, quote, provide possible gussets, Einschlager, in the intentional weave. The introduction of hyletic data within consciousness strengthens the in intimacy. The hyletic data strengthens the intimacy. For Husserl, the emphasis on the noetic over the hyletic is simply a way to move toward the intertwining of noetic with noematic, which he goes on to discuss in the next part of the book. So I'm I'm still kind of progressing towards 96. Is it okay to keep going? All right. In sections 87 to 96, Husserl articulates the heart of the relationship between noesis and noema, from which the remainder of the ideas will spring. This relationship will help to flesh out what consciousness of something means. But the insights, according to Husserl, are, quote, this is page 211, painfully achieved findings. What, what is painful or laborious seems to me to be the fact that consciousness both names something noetic, an act, and something all-embracing of act and object. The fact that consciousness routinely gets separated from the object by us is that we tend to claim ownership over the entire situation by means of a part of it. And this part, this activity, allows the whole situation of the event of meaning, this is page 212 at the top, to be, quote, naturally concealed from us. What's painful is that we conceal ourselves from ourselves. But if we follow out the correlation of noesis and noema and begin to understand how the noema both is the object we are conscious of, and yet is also distinct from that object, that I think is part of the problem that Felix mentioned, though maybe not the whole problem. 
we can see how the relation of noesis to noema allows consciousness itself to present itself as the situation that situates us. It is, as Husserl says, close to the middle of 212, the correlation that will be one of the most important, quote, concatenations of essence, Wesen zu Samenhangen, which make the transcendental relations intelligible a priori. So Olga, I mean, clearly he thinks most of the time he's doing eidetic work. Noesis Noema is eidetic structure. It is the, quote, hanging together of Noesis and Noema, their mutual belonging, that makes what appears after the transcendental reduction a field of describable events. The Noema, as Felix intimated, is really a new phenomenon. It is the correlate of consciousness, the sense of the object, and yet it has its own power. It is not a function of the noetic act, even though it is an index of noetic acts. And this is why I believe Husserl says that consciousness of something is both, quote, obviously understandable, selbstverstandliches, and highly enigmatic, unverstandliches. Literally understandable and completely foreign. Not understandable. The noema and its correlation with the noesis is what will allow phenomenology at the bottom of page 12 to test descriptions and to point out the unnoticed intrusions of empty verbal meanings. Everything rests on proper distinction, but the advent of the noema means that we use descriptions as tests of what appears in its relation to us, that we really interrogate our descriptions to see if they are partners with what appears. This is section 88. To begin to speak of the noema and the correlation with the noesis, Husserl needs to stake out the way in which we will look at the lived experience both as an act that retains a transcend transcendent object within it and at the experience as a whole, quote, as an object like any other. This is page 213. To do that, he needs to ask two sets of questions. First, what are the, quote, components proper at the top in the italics? page 213, in order to perform, quote, analysis of the really inherent ein reell, R-E-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, analysis. And second, to allow the lived experience to move as an intending of an object that is within it by not inhering to it. So um, this notion of what inheres in the lived experience and what does not inhere I think is is important, the notion of inhering. So first it was belonging. Noesis and Noema belong to each other. And then it's going to be what inheres and what does not inhere, what sticks within. And what does that bring to the notion of within or imminence? And I think there's some part of this is relevant to what you were asking, Olga. The designation Rael thus means the parts of the lived experience that dwell within it, without which it would not be a lived experience. The designation intentional will mean the lived experience insofar as it is broken open to the sense that always points outside of it and does not rest easy within the act. The noetic part or moment of each lived experience is what can allow the lived experience, quote, to include in itself, in sich zu bergen, bear in itself, something like a sense. This is at the bottom of page 213, like four lines from the bottom. Notice that bergen can mean shelter or hide. A sense dwells within, takes shelter in the noetic. What is precisely noetic, Husserl says, is the directing of the regard, the seizing upon something, holding it fast, acts of making evident, like explicating, relating, etc. All of these moments of noetic acts, then, are really inherent in a lived experience. They are in it, Bill, as our organs are in our body. But what these real organs do is to, this is page 214 at the top, quote, refer to what is not really inherent, weist auf nicht real, namely by means of the heading of sense, meaning. Meaning, then, is this miraculous capacity of calling forth inherent moments of acts and objects by means of inhering together toward a sense that is not inherent, that transcends them. So Noesis and Noema and the internal parts to these things are sticking together in order to have something within 
that is transcendent within imminence. There's there's a sticking together to promote what cannot be stuck within the act of consciousness. The noematic part of each lived experience, Husserl says, is, quote, demonstrable and actual pure intuition. So you were right, it's intuitive. We can see the noema. We can experience it. This is the perceived as such, the remembered as remembered. The noema is that which the noesis shelters, but its inherence is not that of a sine qua non. The noema is, from the perspective of the possibility of a lived experience, an inherent part, but its inhering occurs by way of an immediate difference from the noetic moment. Husserl says on page 214 near the bottom that in every case, the noematic correlate is to be taken precisely as it inheres. That word inheres is translating the, the verb leagued as it lies, right? L-I-E-G-T. The noema is to be taken precisely as it inheres imminently in the lived experience, just as it is offered, Darga Boltenverd, to us when we inquire purely into this lived experience itself. The word for in here is leaked, as in there is a tiger lying over there. It may be in the zoo, and we might be safe, but it still keeps its uncaged quality. That's why we go see it. The tiger, in a sense, offers itself to us in a thrilling capacity, and the noema also maintains itself as it, quote, offers itself. The different manner in which the noetic is inherent and the noema is imminent is inherent, the different manner in which the noetic is inherent and the noema is inherent, comes to the fore when Husserl next says that, this is 214 at the bottom, quote, it is obvious that the perception and the accompanying liking of a blossoming apple tree are not at the same time what is perceived and liked. So it's obvious that the perceiving and the liking are not the same as what is perceived and liked. This not at the same time marks out and describes the difference in the manners of inhering, a distinction between the noesis and noema that permits their distinction within their radical belonging together. Uh, if we consider the tree in relation to our eye, Outside of the transcendental reduction, we would suppose real relations, real verhaltnisse, between tree, retina, and consciousness or mind. But we are within immanental lived experience. There are no longer real relations in the sense that we uncritically take the object to be separate from us and have to construct a path from it to us. The object is given within the lived experience as what it is. The object is neither distant nor close. It is within. Uh, we're on section 88, Gordon. And nice to see you. Page 215 in the middle. Thus, there is a relation between perceiving and perceived. In fact, there's more than one relation in the case of the experience of the blooming apple tree. We both perceive and like the tree. So we have multiple noetic acts and multiple layers of noematic sense, or perhaps even multiple noemata. This, quote, relation between perceiving and perceived embraces both lived experiences of liking and perceiving insofar as they, quote, this is on uh, page 215, about 15 lines from the bottom, as they fit ein ordnet into the transcendental stream. This notion of fit or placement Ein ordinate, I think, can be something like ordered or placed within, is important. The lived experiences fit with each other and intend the same noema because they fit with one another within a single stream of time consciousness. They happen simultaneously. And because they fit within the noema itself, which supports or places them together in that stream. A sense of fit is also what is made between noetic and noematic universally. Neither can act alone except insofar as it fits into the other. We are now poised to ask the question what the perceived as such is and which eidetic moments it includes. This is 216 at the top. It's a quote. Which eidetic moments it includes, Berga, in itself as this perception noema. The goal, as always, is to faithfully describe the Troy Beschreiben, the appearing as appearing. The notion of as within the perceived as such or appearing as appearing is key. The eidos is signaled within 
the as structure. The perception of the table as table, the blossoming tree as lovely, the woods as lovely, dark and deep. The eidos is within the seeing as. Section 89. In order to make sense of the noema, Husserl compares the noema of the perceived tree with the tree simpliciter, schlechthin. The tree simpliciter can burn up, be reduced to carbon. The noema, however, is not made of wood. It is made of meaning or sense. And this kind of belonging to the essence of the perception has no space between it and the act of perceiving. Thus, there is no introduction of anything between its gaps. I believe that this distinction helps Husserl to make clear that the relationship of being and expression is grounded in lived experience. Meaning belongs to experience and dwells within it while retaining its transcendence. Its pointing outwards, which is the sense of its transcendence, does not reduce its belonging. In fact, the only measure of space is the gap between the noema and the object of scientific or natural attitude. For the imminent noema, this is page 217 at the top, which, quote, passes over Ubergate into the eidos, the imminent noema is, another quote, three lines down, separated by an abyss from all of nature. The noema and the object in the familiar sense then cannot be connected. The noema needs to be, it's 217 at the top still, quote, sharply distinguished from the object's simpliciter. This distinction allows the noema's particular situation of givenness to come to the fore. When we consider the object outside of the reduction, givenness does not enter into the situation. The object is a passive thing among other things, and the relations come about indirectly and according to logic that we are not a part of but must learn as if separate from them. Within the reduction, the noema is the force of its appearing by being given within the situation as belonging to the act that notices it. The noema is, this is 217 still, quote, the mode of givenness in which it is precisely something intended to in the perception. So Sally was right in talking about the correlation between noema and intention. Both noema and noesis then are a situation of mutual implication in a project of givenness that neither begins on its own, neither noema nor oasis begins the project of givenness on its own, but which, givenness, claims them both. Phenomenology responds to givenness by a, quote, specifically peculiar reflection, still 217, that is directed to the noema, quote, as it is imminent in the perception. So the noema can be in perception in multiple ways. And um, the mode of the noema's appearing, its manner of being imminent, shifts as the noetic moments that are called into action present themselves and the noema. The fundamental situation of imminence has eidetic structures, but the ways in which the noema's appearing varies this fundamental situation are the point of experience. Hence, the task of phenomenology as having, quote, this is 217, to conform in faithful expression, Troyum Ausdruck, to what is seized upon in it. The description of the togetherness of noesis and noema will shift from perception to memory to anticipation to fantasy, etc. And this is something that I saw for the first time reading this carefully. It's very easy, I think, to think of object and just like it's it's uh, indifferent whether we're seeing a tree or seeing a tree in memory or fantasizing one. They're all objects, and so we're somehow we're bringing to the object the character of itself as object. But Husserl is saying there's something essentially different about the perceived tree and the remembered tree and the fantasized tree, and those are different noemata, and those noemata are motivating this whole shift in the experience. So um, it must be possible for phenomenology to describe the differences between memory and perception by means of attending to the layers of sense in the noema. 
Um, so they just look different. A remembered tree looks different than a perceived tree, and we have to be able to find out in the thing how it marks itself out as that. Um, section 90. Having something in its sense, in its givenness as meaningful correlate, having the noema as perceived, etc., expresses the closeness of the relation to the noema. Having, in the sense of having um, the sense, is a kind of internal link, so much more than the kind of having of private property. Having the noema is not just a matter of sense bestowal of the noema as correlate. Having is not simply, and I just mean this like in, in consciousness, how do you have the object? Having is not simply reflective, actional, or direct. Having the noema is also a number of other noetic moments that are not reflective, that are not actional, that are not active, that are indirect. The task of phenomenology is to describe the manner of inhering, belonging, and having that are at work in all levels of each experience. So really for me, it's three things that I'm focusing on in this webinar with you. Inhering, belonging, and having. As Fischerl says at the bottom of page 218, what is most important, again, is, quote, the uh, absolutely faithful description, Getroyan Beschreibung, of what is actually present, vorliegt, what lies before, what is um, in phenomenological purity, and in keeping at a distance, fan haltung, all the interpretations transcending the given. Given this, then, requires a certain kind of distinction, a description. What lies before our view when given this is the way in which an oema appears, requires us to pause, to keep any attempt at expression in slow motion. The given should call for its own translation. The words should appear as given within the given. Like literally, we should be reading off from things what to say about them. The situation of the description should feel like it is given by the given itself. And this relationship of expression to noema should thus echo the way, quote, this is page 218, the intention is given with its intentional object, which, as we see at the bottom of 218, is something in which the noema, quote, inseparably belongs, un ab trenbar zugehorge, the noema inseparably, inseparably belongs to the intention. This inseparable belonging Thus means further that the noema, and this is a quote, 218 at the bottom, inherently dwells, reel ein vona, within the intention. The language of dwelling or of inseparable belonging is thus the language of inseparability, unabtrenbarkeit. The experienced tree, which is both the same as the tree outside of us, and yet not at all that passive thing at the mercy of impersonal relations. The wood of the tree, its dependence on water and earth and sun, its position in the garden as intended by the architect, all these are part of the noema. But the sense of those relations is something that lives in a different way within our acts of taking up and noticing and seizing upon and holding. The noema, as correlate, belongs to the essence of the perception. Now I'm in 91. Once we have understood the distinction between noema an object, we are ready in section 91 for a kind of earth-shaking news. The noema, page 221, is inhering, won't ein, in the lived experience in different ways. So I said it previously. This is where he says it. Quote, the noematic sense is different in kind, art verschiedenen, in various sorts of lived experiences. The experience of the blossoming tree may be what we describe as the same in a perception of fantasy and memory evaluating. But this same expression does not negate the fact that, 221 in the middle, quote, the noematic correlates are still essentially different. The distinctions in the different noematic senses or layers are both in the noema and in the noetic acts themselves. The noetic acts do not lend their characteristics to the one noema. 
Rather, the noema has a different look, a different layer of sense that it allows the noetic act to uncover. The noema's different sense is the way it calls for and responds to the difference in the noetic act. Working together, the perception and the perceived are a different lived experience than the remembering and the remembered. As Husserl says here, quote, these are the characteristics which we find present in, or finden, the perceived as perceived, as something inseparable and as something necessarily belonging, zugahoraga, in correlation to the respective kinds of noetic processes. The correlation, then, is the finding of a noematic layer that calls for exactly this kind of belonging to exactly this kind of noetic act. We ought to find new ways, I think Husserl is saying, for describing the difference in kind of perceptual object, remembered object, etc. It's not just degrees of clarity or distinctness. The noema would then be something that has a core, but also different layers of sense that would go into making the full noema. The full noema, with all of the layers of different sense, would then center around a core, say the tree itself, which would also center around a pure objective sense, an X, if you will, the letter X, like an ab abstract. This centering within a center allows for us to have different experiences of the same thing. The noema is in contact with the noesis, but also within itself, the noema is in contact with itself. The noema has a self-relation that allows the noetic acts to have their self-relation to the ego. The parallelism is complete and total between noetic and noematic, which it needs to be in order for the noema to have any agency of its own and in order for givenness to be the complex relation of experience to itself as to its own source. Section 92. As Husserl continues to map the way in which noesis and noema belong together, he turns in section 92 to the discussion of, quote, attentional changes, changes of attention. I once had a professor, uh, Pierre Kurtzberg at Penn State, who was teaching Husserl for a while. And I still remember him talking about ideas and saying, it's all a matter of attention. Everything comes down to attention. So pay attention. This is the thing on attention. That's what he used to say. Um, I haven't read this since him, right? So he, he left, by the way, and wouldn't do my dissertation with me. He left for France and left, you know, so I was all on my own figuring out Husserl. But um, I still I still think he's a good writer on Husserl. But this was his section. So hopefully I will do Pierre Kurtzberg uh, justice. The noetic is a province of, a, of rays of a regard that are shaped or colored differently depending on the type of act. This is 223 at the top. Quote, the ray of the pure ego's regard sometimes goes through one noetic stratum and sometimes through another, through one encasement level, Schachtelungsstufe, or another. I don't think Husserl uses this encasement level word very often, certainly not in this book prior to this. It's like Husserl is excavating what happens in the noetic moments of experience. Our freedom means that we can turn on a dime uh, and turn our regard or attention through one action or through another. And when we do so, our relation to objectivity or to sense shifts. Husserl talks about how a memory might suddenly strike one while perceiving, and then, quote, this is middle of 223, the regard goes through a remembering noesis into a world of memory. This is amazing, right? The concatenations of essences shift. We enter a different world. What we need to do in phenomenological description then is to fix the regard and the sense. We need to stay within one encasement level and to fix 223 at the bottom, about five lines from the bottom, fix the attentional ray as wandering, wanderung, in a determinate manner. We need to stay on the same level and in the same world in order to be able to give faithful expression to what appears in the manner of its appearing. This requires us to discipline our attention and our expression. Self-discipline does not mean automation. We can still wander. We can still catch ourselves in surprising shifts of attention that are fortuitous for hermeneutics. But we need to give ourselves a chance to cash out meaning rather systematically. 
For what is certain is that it is the possibility of moving, changing attention, shifting levels that allows sense to matter to us. So, you know, I think it's a trope that uh, analytic philosophy creates distinctions, and then by creating distinctions, it finds new meanings. Husserl is like that. We're not we're not just arbitrarily cutting stuff and seeing what happens. That's like vivisection. I think he would say. What what we're doing is we're allowing a determinate bounded process by which experience can wander within one noematic layer or one noematic re, noetic regard, and we're trying to cash out what happens on those. Um, the distinctions that matter, in other words, are within the given. We don't have to make them in order to make meaning appear. Uh, for what is certain, it's possibility of moving. We attest to the unity of the noema of sense by moving through one noesis and then another. We allow sense to claim us by being the unity of the ego in response to the unity of the noema. Attention as a noetic practice, Husserl says on page 224, is the act of favoring and then of moving on from one layer to another. Attention then is the affordance or the clearing that allows for appearance to show itself. Changes in the noetic bottom of 224 affect its noema. Attention is then somewhat like a spotlight, he says. This is still in 224. But this does not mean that the light itself inaugurates the change. Rather, Quote, the concrete noemas, this is the very bottom of 224 to the top of 225. Um, the concrete noemas change through and through. The noemas shift their mode of givenness. Of course, there are many times when attention is not personal or reflective or immediate. I am continuing to hear the music in the background as I type this sentence, but I have misspelled something and I go back and erase and the music recedes from my attention. Yet it returns as I am now typing this word, and I have the consciousness of the same piece of music. It has not restarted or stopped altogether. But when the attention is actional, when I am attending to what I write here and the need for a comma at the end of this dependent clause, then I have the sense of my, quote, subjectiveness. And still on 225, sort of towards the bottom, quote, the ray of attention presents itself gives itself as emanating from the pure ego and terminating into that which is objective. The ray does not become detached from the ego. All this is to say that attention is really important. The attentional ray then is a noetic manner in which the core of who I am is invested, terminates in the noema. And Bill, this is why I think it's still embodied. Uh, I think it's through listening, through hearing, the attentional ray is as embodied as we're going to make it. That's just me, though. I am not a creator remaining outside my work. I am an investment of myself in the noema, and the noema is an investment in me. I am invested in appearing within the whole situation of experience, too, through my attention. But my ego is only able to be present to the object because its presence to me is one of quote, attachment of belonging. It is like a kind of love. My attention is attached to me, and thus the object can be attached to me through my attention. My desire is my opening to the thing and the thing's givenness to me. I, I rather see a, a continuum between attention and desire. The full noema has a variety of different ways of living in my experience. My ego, likewise, and this is page 226, has, quote, a multiplicity of describable manners in which it lives in a certain lived experience. My ways of living are the responses to the ways in which I attend to the object's calls. Attention is the way the ego lives in lived experiences. The modes of givenness of the objects correlate to the modes of attention. This is 93. 93 will be very brief. 95 and 96 will be fairly brief. I think it's about five minutes that I would need something like that. And then we can uh, pause and we can talk, or you can talk. This is 93. The intimacy of the noesis and noema then is certain. This is 226 at the bottom. Quote, there can be no noetic moment 
without a noematic moment belonging Zugahorga to it. This relation is one that is fully of meaning as orchestrating or organizing being, as Husserl says that the object encountered as the noema has a, this is 227, about five lines up from the middle, the noema has, quote, a dignity peculiar to it. The dignity of the noema, I might suggest, is that it has an eidetic relation to the noesis. These two belong essentially together and can show one another different modes of belonging, perception, memory, fantasy, etc., but always of a kind of overarching intimacy and structure. There is no more inward belonging than the noema to the noesis, than the noesis to its ego, than the noema to itself, and all of these to the experience that situates them all. So sometimes we might think of a love relationship as like a third thing that it arches over both people, even though it isn't separate, yet we can point to that relationship as if it were separate, as if it were calling us. This is what I mean by experience as situating us within the situation that it presents. Section 95. As Husserl goes on to describe the internal relation of the noetic, he notes how an act of perceiving quote, founds a stratum of valuing which overlays uber decenda, it completely. The noetic is thus a stratified whole, fundierungsganzen. One noetic act, the perceiving, not only makes possible the valuing, it belongs to the valuing. It, quote, founds the latter's sense, page 231. There is no way that my act of perceiving could bubble up into valuing, sustain it, be of the same thing, unless the intimacy of my self-relation were a gift or a loan from my object relation in the realm of meaning. I couldn't have both a perception and a value intimately linked to each other unless I were intimately linked with the object. Meaning is the situation of being. Indeed, I believe in this section on the bottom of page 232, Husserl makes it clear that the internal relation of noesis and noema, the intimacy founding the freedom of the noetic, is what has made the reduction itself possible. Quote, just as the perceived as perceived stands over against Gegenüber state, the perceiving in a way excluding the question of whether the perceived truly exists. So the valued as valued stands over against the valuing and likewise, in a way, excluding the question of the being of the value. We can reduce our immediate natural attitude because the work of exclusion is always already a capacity of the internal relation of subjectivity to objectivity. Experience itself excludes certain questions. All we need to do is make the exclusion an explicit practice. To have the experience as such is to manifest the founding of being by meaning. Intimacy grounds separation. The reduction is therefore understandable and possible from within experience. It is not an arbitrary thing that Husserl happened to discover, the epoche and the reduction. It did not happen from doubting, but from following through the way in which we are always already consciousness of, where that means that the object dwells in us and sets us up to follow, to invest in, and to be claimed by it. In case you were wondering, this is 96 now, and I'm almost done. Uh, in case you were wondering how, well, I'm done for now. <laughs> uh, torturing, I know, I'm to torturing you all. Uh, in case you were wondering how Husserl might have arrived at experience as such, situating the very distinction of noesis and noema by founding them, he says at the beginning of section 96, that he has arrived at the distinction of noesis as taking up the entire lived experience and, quote, emphasizing its noetic components. Betonung, emphasizing. The noetic then is a matter of emphasis, betonung, or accent. This suggests that the ego and its freedom and activity is both less powerful than the ego of Descartes and more interesting. For Husserl, the ego's freedom and power and attachment to the object are, in a sense, in its own hands, in its attention. But it is also liable to a shift in emphasis. 
the noema exerts its own power, and the task then is to be faithful to the situation of experience as such, for this is what ought to be in control, experience, not the I. There is an ethics of experience to try to be faithful to the given as only allowing for our emphasis on the noetic in order to allow the whole to come to light as not really dependent on us. So, Bill, this is where I'm sort of pushing back against a certain interpretation of noetic, which I hope will be helpful. The first step toward that self-overcoming, then, in phenomenology, we need to overcome this sense of ownership and domination, will be to focus on the noema and how it is at the top of page 234, implicit, here's that verb again, legan, in the lived experience. How does the noema lie there in our experience? It is not inherent or implicit in the way the noetic is, and yet the noema is tied to the noetic intimately. There seems to be both a, still at the top of 234, quote, clean separation, reinliche Scheidung, and a parallel structure of noesis and noema. How are we to arrive at both at the same time? Here the chapter ends with an ethical demand, again, for faithful description of what we, from our point of view, and after the most serious study, actually see. We need to say about these experiences, and this is like five lines from the bottom of 235, what must be said. He emphasized the word. So let's... Uh, take a break from Peter saying stuff and have you all say so. Okay, can I just, uh, just one kind of, kind of broad point that really struck me, I think it comes out in what you said at the end about the ethics of experience, because it's, it, it, it's very striking that the, the extent to which Husserl talks about the difficulty of what he's trying to do, right? He talks about the journey, he talks about the painfulness of it, and then at the end, right at the end here, he talks about, you know, um, uh, the explorer on 235 journeying to an unknown part of the world, right? But, but, but it's very paradoxical because this unknown part of the world is precisely experience which we all have, right? Um, which can't be unknown in a fundamental sense. Um, and it and it strikes me always very like like Descartes uh, in the discourse on method, right? But it is where he starts by saying, you know, we all have this bon sens, we all have this good sense, but but it somehow got hidden from us, uh, it somehow got overlaid. And it's a similar type of point I think Chris was making here, right? That that um, that uh, we have to tear away so much that, so to speak, hides or distorts. The, the, the those structures of experience that are already always already at play um and 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 and, and so and, and i think i mean i think it's, it's it's really interesting methodologically but also as you say ethically because there's an ethics involved there right because there's a there's a call to be true to the experience that we're somehow falsifying you know in our you know everyday life somehow falsifying so it's not really a question, but more just a kind of that the, the strikes me as, as as very strongly inherent in this whole in this whole section. Okay, well maybe I'll uh, say a few words. Or excuse me, Peter, are you going to resonate to what Felix said? Did I jump into what you? I mean, I just I think it's excellent. I don't need to uh, uh, respond to each person, but uh, I certainly would. I I took Felix. I took your lens of faithful description this time for this webinar, and I found it everywhere. Without your claim as to the ethics of experience, I would have been blind to it, and it it's everywhere now that I look at it. So I, I think you're absolutely right. What I also notice is how, for me, it's increasingly a religious structure to the ideas as a whole. Um, you know, he says this in the crisis, of course, that it's it's like a religious conversion. 
Um, but I took that as a stray claim of his. That I am by looking at the way the noema is imminent, the transcendence is imminent, and the return to the ground. I mean, I'm looking at Meister Eckhart and I'm thinking, this is really husserl. Uh, in some important way and so you weren't saying that just now but this is you know this is what's resonating for me is just how much of a of a of increased self-awareness is necessary to unconceal all of the things that are just sort of right there so i really appreciate your point felix a lot yeah, and, and and just to follow up on that, this a uh, uh, pop occur in the you know in his commentary on the ideas, which I agree with you, it's a very difficult uh, text, but but he does make that point about it being there's an asceticism here, there's an ascetic kind of um, element to the method, and and you can see that here, like the whole question of self control and so on that he that he brings in. Okay, so um, I feel nearly embarrassed uh, to bring this up um, after what the two of you said, um, because um, there is a, an ordinary logic in what I am asking, while you seem Felix and Peter yourself, in your understanding of consciousness, uh, you seem to be coming out from a realm outside of the ordinary <laughs> logical uh, thinking. It's um, it's some kind of a completely different thinking that what I'm trying to bring in, but I'll say it anyway. So, when Husserl talks about ego, about the ego, this is always the transcendental ego. So, and the transcendental ego is completely neumatically filled. So there is no um, domain or sphere or inch of space, so to say, in the transcendental ego, which would not be completely containing and basking in the world, uh, it seems. So the question is then, is there anything to me or to a human being apart from being completely filled by the world, am I just a collection of noemata intermingled with some kind of capacity which emerged and completely founded on the real world? I mean, in the logical investigation, investigations, uh, Husserl goes to overkill to posit idealities. So, uh, is there any ideality left after the noetic noematic analysis, which would uh, have a life? outside of being totally founded on materially filled noematic forms, you know? And this, this, this is, I keep thinking that maybe I just cannot abstract enough to conceive uh, a picture of the world which has objects and relationships, uh, noesis 
relationships, right? Intentional relationships towards a nomadic object. But these relationships are not founded on anything except for the object. Uh, because the ego pole or any, any substance, any, anything which would um, uh, account for the nature of these unique relationships, asymmetrical relationships, relationships which allow for um, subjectivity, first personness. Uh, it is not there. I mean, when we think relationships uh, with regard to the world, um, this is also relationship between two substances, some kind of properties built on substances, right? And then, then we have relationships. But here we have this um, kind of relationships which are hanging uh, in nothing, you know? Uh, so that's, I guess, it's a question of the nature of intentionality which uh, I think in this model, which we discussed is completely uh, proceeding uh, from the objects. So I, I, I just cannot fail with it. I, I, I'm trying to stop this questioning because there must be some error in this thinking, because if there is a mind of a, like Husserl's and he was capable obviously to be very comfortable with the absence of the ego pool, uh, existential or ontological uh, absence. Uh, but but uh, it seems to be very difficult uh, logically to get rid of the question of the origin or foundation of intentionality. Uh, basically. Part of what I think might be said about that is a lot of things. Maybe one thing is the noetic, noematic correlation is not in the world. That's one aspect of it, which I think we need to, which I think is there. Another way to look at it is and this is getting into a little bit of a metaphysical interpretation, which Husserl wasn't completely explicit about. But what does it mean that there is meaning? Like when we say, what do you mean by being? The noes, the, the noema finally is being as meaning. And meaning is not a property of being. It's not a property of beings. It pertains to being itself. And so we're talking about the noetic, nomadic correlation is between the I as engaging in activity which grasps what an object is. And to grasp what an object is, is to grasp its meaning. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but uh, I mean, those, I, I think, I think that's what it com comes down to. And this well, is kind of, it's, it's kind of uh, Twilight Zone material, but I think this is what's going on. I've got, I've got to um, push back against um, what you said, Jeremy, and also maybe what, what Olga is getting at. And, and I'm not sure that this is what struck me when um, Peter was talking, was this notion that, um, like the thing that occurred to me is he was talking about like, I'm looking at a tree outside my window and or am I remembering a tree or something like that. And how these really the no noema itself are ch is altered by the noetic act itself. And, um, and so they, they're so bound, tightly bound together that the noetic act of um, seeing a tree or even being standing near a tree and remembering a tree or even talking about the word tree are vastly different. And, and so what I was actually thinking about 
um, is um, AI. And about, um, um, I have everyone familiar with um, Putman's Brain in the Bat um, discussion way back in the 70s or something. Um, I think, I think um, anyway, I hope everybody knows what I'm talking about when I talk about Brain in the Bat. But um, so the idea of AI, so the thing is, is that we see these on TV, I've never done this, but people are wearing things on their faces and they think they're playing tennis, but um, it's, it's not, they're not, they're not playing tennis. And so the question is, how do we know, to get back to Putman's question, that we're not brains in vats? Now, that's, that's a very difficult question. He, he says that we can know. But um, the point is that um, how do we know that we're not remembering something and that we're actually, you know, standing near a tree? How do we know the difference? And I think it has to do with noetic characteristics, how they're noetically different. And because they're noetically different, we know that there are different kinds of experiences. And this comes back to the question that really, when I was listening to Peter, I kept asking myself this, how do I know that what I'm experiencing is my experience? And, um, and that has to do with, it seems to me, it has something to do with noesis, that noetic acts are my noetic acts. You know, no one, no, 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 I mean, they're so weird. I don't really understand them because they have the feeling that there's some sort of platonic thing that floats around somewhere. Um, I think we need to push back against that notion. They're, 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 the noema may be as embodied as, the no, as, the no, as noetic. And, they're, and the, um, anyway, I have the feeling that we've split things apart. So now we have to realize what Peter keeps trying to tell us is there really one? Now we split them apart and we think they're somehow or other they live in their own little worlds. No, they don't exist as a whole. And so that's the part we have to be able to put them back together again in this world in which we, um, we live in and, and move our hands and have bodies in. Um, anyway, I'm babbling. Well, yeah. Jeremy said that uh, you said that noetic relationships or noetic correlation is not in the world. And if it isn't in the world, then where? Can you? Um, I, I'm trying. There is a sense in which it obviously has something to do with the world. We have bodies and light waves hit our eyes and things happen in our bodies. And were it not for that, we wouldn't be seeing anything. But if that's all there was, there would no be no seeing. Because seeing is the manifest. In seeing that something exists is manifest to us. And things exists is not something physical and can play no role in physics. There's no physical law that contains the fact that something exists as an element. So the challenge is to understand how it is that we, yes, who are in this physical world and phys have physical characteristics that nevertheless at the same time going along with these physical processes, something is happening, which is the disclosure of the reality of things around us. And that is something that is not in the world. Another well, way to put it is the fact that something is, is not in the world that that thing is in. Yeah, I understand. I understand uh, what you are saying. Um, and you know, if I switch gears, like let's say to Vedanta, you know, I can think this way. However, what bothers me is not, not the easiness of the possibility to think this way. And that Husserl, obviously, or it seems to me, doesn't think this way. So it's more of the possibility of thinking like Husserl, who doesn't seem to attribute any substantiality to ideas whatsoever. Uh, 
whether in the world or outside of the world. That's number one. And then second, he is not bothered by the question of the ground of intentionality, whether outside of the world, in God, in something which is completely immaterial and maybe non-ideal altogether or something that we cannot verbalize. He keeps saying that he rejects the question of the universal ground. And yet, intentional relationships qualitatively are asking for some kind of substrate to ground, neither material nor immaterial, or like something outside of the world, something which would account for the possibility of seeing. I mean, he posits the horizon of pure seeing, uh, and then, then that's it, you know? So, so uh, I'm trying to understand how is it possible to think without conceiving this something completely outside of the world, or how is it possible to think relationships outside of the something else which would have entered this relationship with something else. Unless we start thinking that relationships are the ground of the world, unless we completely give, on, give up on objects and in a manner of physics, we start thinking that pure, aware, uh, pure relationships are the foundations, foundation for cognition or for human being in general. You know, it seems like we have to completely turn metaphysics of objects inside out and or get rid of it. And then maybe this kind of thinking is possible. Otherwise, it seems to me illogical and I struggle with it. So, so one thing might be that, you know, any er I should I should mention this every time. And any errors are mine and not Husserl's, right? So, so one possible possible thing is that I am really trying hard to attribute a democracy to experience in which the thing has an agency of its own. And I think he talks like that metaphorically sometimes, but I'm really pushing that. And you know, maybe inappropriately, but that's what I I am interested in. It's what I hear. Um, so just check it against your own reading of the book. I can also be wrong. Lots of Husserl people would say that I'm mushing things together in ways that aren't appropriate. I'm not maintaining different levels. Like, I, you know, I'm just a, a reader like any of you. But I do think that um, what, what he says in the crisis is really helpful. This isn't quite a historic, a, 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 an ego with historicity, uh, in in the in the book of the ideas, right? But in in the crisis, he says that there's a fundamental tension or um, paradox that subjectivity exists. On the one hand, I am within the world as something encounterable in the world, and on the other hand, the world is within my consciousness. So, I how is it possible that I, as part of this world, can be consciousness and have the world as transcendence within it. And I think that that doesn't need me to be a historical being as Peter in order to be true, but it is true because of the historical being that is Peter. And so the question of what I bring to experience is, at least in the reading for today, my attention, what I um, favor in terms of where I am, in my life or in the literal physical position like it what what i discover about the world and about things is as much the questions that i bring to them or the the orientation that i bring to them as it is them um so there is a role for me but you know and i'll, I'll end very quickly because i always promise not to say anything and then i end up saying stuff but it's only because you guys are talking about really cool things i so i blame you really for my own talking um but you know, I, I I think that 
he is really suspending the question of what is the origin of intentionality. And it does feel like to me that relationships are the essential structure because the noema is the index of noetic acts. And that does seem to be on the way to the object just being a placeholder for noetic activity. But I don't think he means that. I really think he means that um, because we are temporal beings, we cannot get to all sides of the object at once. And therefore, the object as index of acts is not a reduction of the object to me. It's because we are historical and limited, we are finite insofar as we encounter objects. It is because of that, that the object, in a sense, is partnering in the origin of intentionality. But it's just like, you know, we're born into families that we didn't set up. We know because after a while we figure out, you know, I wouldn't do things this way, right? So, but we're born into these family relationships that we didn't set up, but we experience according to their structure. We experience and we're born into intentionality and experience according to that structure. And that's about all we can say. If you want a viewpoint from which you can judge intentionality and its origin, that viewpoint itself is only going to be given within intentionality if it's to make any sense at all. So I think there's just a lot of silence about this point because there couldn't be anything else and have, have it be honest. At least that's that's what I take Husserl to be saying. So please tell me how I'm how I'm missing it because that th well. Well, uh, back to Hulia, what makes them sentient? I mean, there are theories, of course. We can call it life. We can, you know, talk about it a lot, but it's just a word. Right, so um, how is it possible that Hulia are sentient? It's just the way to reformulate the same question. I, I kind of wish he never developed that. I, I just, <laughs> I don't like it. It just doesn't sit well with me. I don't think they are, but I think, um, I what I've come to, and I said this in the in the piece on that, is that he it has to be at every level an interplay of subject and object if it's going to remain that way. So what he's done is to take moments that do not come about in an actual lived experience as components of those lived experiences and show how they too, bear the same structure of correlation. So even those things that we are not conscious of that are on the way to providing us with, as Bill said earlier, characteristics that we can focus on, even those things have to maintain that relationship of distinction, but unity within distinction or whatever it is. Like, because if they don't, then, then consciousness will have these, um, moments that it cannot account for that it can see peripherally like when the television goes out and you see all the pixelated dots and you know that pixels go into making up the image but now you you never see the pixels except when it's broken so anyway if if we had any of that experience then we would doubt consciousness completely and so i think what he says is everything that's on the way to consciousness has the same structure so that consciousness is through and through united with itself. Um, and actually, we won't get to this today probably, but that's actually what I think he means by the neutrality modification. That comes out of, for him, I think, comes out of this whole Hele morphe relationship because we have moved into, with the neutrality modification, into the virtual experiences that we do not attend to, that we are not aware of, and that we perhaps in some unconscious or even conscious way suppress in order to have other 
higher levels of of experience like the dur engraving we forget that it's an engraving we forget about the figures in order to focus on the knight and the devil um so anyway but i you know i'm sorry to talk so long but... no no that's that's helpful actually that's helpful um Could... Could we, I'm sorry, Olga, I don't mean to cut you off, but I noticed that it's two o'clock and people may need to go. Would it be okay if we talked a little bit as a group about where you all would like to go from here? Would you like to meet one more time on the ideas and get through at least section 127? Absolutely. Um, all right. Well. Maybe after the new year, maybe something like the middle of January. Would that be okay? Yeah, just send the date. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a Friday, same time. I know that Felix is probably and, and Mo, I don't know where you are, but um, you know, those people outside the United States, you know, let us know if the timing is awful for you. Is this structure okay? This format? Like, are you pissed off at me or bored with me? Like, do you do you want to change? Um no, uh, I think it's a unique, actually, structure, um, and it's very precious uh, this way because nowhere in the world, in universities, within the frame of teaching, uh, this would be discussed. You no, know? so I. I think that we have something very uh, special here, Peter. And uh, you created this format, and I think it's it's the only possible one, <laughs> because otherwise people end up just asking questions, and there is no dialogue. We are maintaining some form of dialogue that understanding is growing from your lecture to discussion back to your lecture it's is that true for other people too are you all okay with that absolutely, absolutely. i want to emphasize that um so i don't know how long we've been meeting now like this five years or something um and often what happens is that um um it's it's sort of um undirected we just sort of um you know ask questions and talk and um and it's interesting but um, but your 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 time that you spent in delivering and preparing these lectures have really given us um, a skeleton to hang on to a discussion, and I find it invaluable. And I really want to thank you for what you're doing here. Well, you're welcome. I I really hope that. I mean, there's probably a hundred ways that I'm wrong, right? And I am very conscious of my own position. So I hope that you will all feel free to send me questions or uh you know challenges whatever you could do it's a, this is so meaningful for me like this is so much more fun for me than than most other things that i do uh, certainly more fun than being chair of a department or something like that it's awful this is just great and you all really are, are pleasant people to be with but please feel free to to, to send things I guess after January, are you all okay to do ideas two, the second volume? Would that be something you would want to pursue? Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay, then then what we'll do I'm, maybe I'm, next. Let me just say about time. ideas two. I'm I'm a hundred percent behind the idea because what often lacks in ideas one is I keep asking um, Edmund. I said, please give me an example of what you're trying to talk about. <laughs> That's a that's true. And ideas too, there are more of them. Yes, that's right. All right. Well, we'll do that. And then you all think about ideas too. And, and if someone wants to step up and do the same thing, I'm happy to recede. I'm happy to keep going. Like I said, I, I, I find a lot of meaning being with you. And uh, I look forward to probably around the middle of January, I think the 16th or 17th is a Monday or Tuesday, or maybe that week. So maybe leave this time open on that Friday, if you'd like. Um, and we'll see if we can uh, do it again. Thank you all very much. I Thank really you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it so much. Thank happy you. holidays. You too. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye.
Was that okay? More uh, than okay. More than